At the present time, millions of Christians believe a great tribulation is coming, but few of us understand the hard choice that is coming. Will it be salvation through faith or survival through works? Think about that for a moment. Will it be salvation through faith or survival through works? This will be the testing choice. After the first four trumpets occur, over a period of about 60 days, as I understand it, everyone will question the possibility of survival. The world will be turned upside down and inside out by God's deadly judgments. Out of earth's smoldering ruins, a monster called Babylon will be created by the religious and political leaders of the world. Babylon will be a one-world crisis government that will be created to carry out a plan that is so stupid that its objective is called maddening wine. Maddening wine. You'll see what I mean. When 25% of the population of the world has been killed and 33% of the earth burned up, the religious and political leaders of earth will respond by scrambling for a global solution to appease God's wrath. Their reasoning will be simple. They will say, God is angry with the whole world because of decadent behavior. The only solution is stop the decadent behavior and God's anger will go away. Simple. You don't need to be a nuclear physicist to figure it out. So, but what tools do political and religious leaders have when it comes to decadent behavior? They have only two, laws and penalties. The political and religious leaders of the world will unite together. They will create a monster of a government in Revelation called a beast, and it will dictate moral laws. All leaders from all nations will agree to obey this crisis government, this monster beast, for fear that God's wrath will continue if they don't obey. Babylon's mission will be one of appeasing God's wrath so that his judgments will cease. That will be the goal. But Babylon's laws will defy God's laws. And the laws of Babylon will blaspheme the testimony of Jesus. And this is how persecution begins. Babylon will demand obedience or punishment. And of course, God says the same. It's obedience or punishment. Through his servants, the 144,000, Jesus will demand the same thing that Babylon demands. This conflict will produce a valley of decision for everyone. If a person obeys God, he'll be punished by civil authorities. If a person obeys the laws of Babylon, he'll be destroyed. He will be destroyed by Jesus during the 70 days of the seven last plagues. The Great Tribulation will appear to be a no-win situation, and unfortunately, it will catch most Christians by complete surprise. Regardless of familial ties, language, culture, education, religion, or race, four simple messages coming straight from God's throne will separate mankind into two groups of people, the sheep and the goats. The first message will begin with day one. It will come from Jesus, and it will be shocking. It will come as an outright demand, 
and billions of people will immediately find it offensive. The 144,000 will declare that the return of Jesus has started. That's right. The return of Jesus has started. It takes 1,335 days. The return of Jesus is a parade of events that culminate on the 1,335th day. And the cool thing about this is that all the wicked will be dead by the 1,334th day. And the saints will be gathered up on the 1,335th. So, the 144,000 will declare the return of Jesus has started, and now everyone is required to worship Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth. Keep in mind, this demand will be proclaimed throughout the world for 1260 days. Here's the message. We just read it a minute ago. Fear God. Give him glory. Because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The message, fear your creator, and, uh, who is Jesus, and worship him, will infuriate, notice, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and atheists. It'll make them furious. Why will they be so mad? Why will they be so angry? Because for them, Jesus Christ is no deity, and he is certainly not the creator. The Jews do not believe that Jesus Christ is the creator, nor that he is the savior, nor that he is the judge of mankind. Neither do Muslims, neither do Hindus, neither do Buddhists, and neither do atheists. So the 144,000 are going to present a very offensive message to these religious bodies. How would you like to be one of the 144,000? Think you would enjoy the job? Do you think you would enjoy the job? If you, if you do, see me after the seminar. I'm going, I, I will help you find a medical doctor. <laughs> but wait, there's something in this first angel's message for everyone. This part of the message, worship the creator, will also infuriate Catholics and Protestants. When the 144,000 declare that worshiping the Creator is not something we can do on our terms. Worshiping the Creator is something we do on His terms. He's God, not us. He requires all mankind to obey His Ten Commandments, specifically resting on His Seventh-day Sabbath. Catholics and Protestants are going to be in an uproar, too. The Creator spoke from Mount Sinai, and He will speak again through the lips of the 144,000. He requires everyone to rest from their work on the seventh day of the week because He made the seventh day to be a memorial to His creation of earth. You know the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make... For yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath 
to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien living within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it unlike. The word holy means unlike. It is unlike the other six. These four commandments were spoken by our Creator and then written on two tablets of stone with His own finger, and these two tablets are now located in heaven's temple. They're in the Ark of the Covenant. Finally, the final part of the first message will really anger whoever has not angry. Here it is. The hour of his judgment has come. This part of the message means that Jesus has begun judgment day. Jesus will now determine who will participate in his coming kingdom. He is the judge of that important decision, not you and me. You can run around thinking all day you're saved. That's like running around all day thinking you're rich. <laughs> it has no bearing on the reality because you do not decide whether you are saved or not. That's why it's called salvation by faith. Faith is a matter of hoping. Faith is a matter of believing when the evidence is not there. What the cheap grace has done today is to make salvation a fact, a matter of fact, and people buy into the fact and, and if you believe you're saved, you're saved. But that's not how it works. And that's what the Great Tribulation is for. It's going to separate fact from fiction. Is this going to be salvation through faith or survival through works? Jesus is the determining factor here. Now, if we obey Jesus, if we pass the test of faith and stand firm and show him that we believe his word and trust in him and put our eternal hope in him, Jesus has assured us, I will save you. So we go into this with the assurance that Jesus has given us, but it's conditional. That assurance is conditional. If you will be my people, I will be your God. And so by setting up a test to see if we will be his people is what this is all about. Jesus will determine the eternal destiny of every person living on earth. He is the judge. We, we don't judge ourselves in, in the sense of determining our salvation. Jesus does that. I always, when I was, when I was in the sixth grade, I always enjoyed it when we got to grade our own test papers. I made very good grades <laughs> correcting my, you know, my own test papers. I was a little bit dishonest. Maybe I was a whole lot dishonest. But when you put it before the teacher, it's out of your hands. And I'm trying to get you to understand 
that coming into this testing time, we can enter this with the assurance of the words that Jesus has given us, that if we put our faith in him, he will save us. But that remains a hope, not a fact, until we are saved, till we are sealed. Letty didn't mention it this morning, but I, th I think this is a crucial point. Remember the seven thunders? During the Great Tribulation, Jesus is going to speak seven times. During the 1260 days, words are going to come from heaven seven times. And those who have been sealed will understand what is being said. Everybody else will hear thunder. So if you have ears to hear, you will hear the voice of Jesus speaking to you, and this will be the assurance that you have been sealed. So if you're in a cave with Kelly... <laughs> my dear brother <laughs> and Kelly hears the voice of Jesus and he says wow Larry that was really really cool and I say well Kelly all I heard was thunder <laughs> Kelly, Kelly will come over and he'll put his arm around me and say Larry something's wrong here buddy something's not right have you given your heart to Jesus? <laughs> no, Jesus himself. You, you know the sealing starts with 144,000, right? They're, they're sealed first before all this starts. And so as time goes by, the number of people sealed begins to increase. And then it flattens off and then drops. The curve drops, you know, down like that. So... Let's suppose that when the first thunder occurs, let's suppose 100,000 more people, 144,000 plus 100,000 more hear the voice of Jesus. Jesus heard the Father speak to him in John 12. Everybody else thought it was thunder. But Jesus knew exactly what the Father said. And so we get to the second time Jesus speaks from heaven. And this time, let's suppose there's this 100,000 plus another 100,000 that are sealed. So now we have 344,000 people hearing the voice of Jesus. And, and the beauty of this is that those who hear the voice and understand the words, they have received the assurance of the, they're sealed. How gracious of God to do that. Letty made a beautiful point that this was, a, this was private. This was a private. John heard the seven thunders and he was about to write them down. Remember? You want to write them out? No, no, no. You wait because these messages will only be heard by those who have ears to hear. Wouldn't it be cool to be in the first group to be sealed so that you get to hear all seven messages? I like that. But as long as you get to hear one of them, <laughs> that's all, you're good to go. You're good to go. And when you're sealed, and when you're sealed, hey, look, the battle is over. The battle is over. Jesus has confirmed your salvation, you have no worries. Now all you've got to do is keep your eyes on him until you either are made a martyr or you are translated without seeing death. And if you, hey, look, if you're, if you're made a martyr and you die early on in the great tribulation, what's wrong with sleeping through the rest of it? What's really wrong with that? Nothing. The scripture says, blessed are those who die in the Lord. You know, 
their, their labors are over. And they will be resurrected to see Jesus come the last 10 days of the 1335. So Jesus will determine the eternal destiny of every person. The judgment of the living begins with day one. Jesus clearly says the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, John 5, 22. Contrary to what billions of people think, Jesus is the creator. Paul says in Colossians 1, 16, For by him, Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Babylon will be created by the religious and political leaders of the world, and it will begin to function and persecute lawbreakers about two months after the global earthquake. Remember, the leaders of Babylon do not know anything about God's plans. Therefore, they will be executing a plan that seems reasonable, justifiable, and appropriate, given the incredible loss of life and endless destruction they see. And the people of earth will agree. Notice in Revelation 13, 3, it says here, the whole world was astonished and followed Babylon, the beast. Followed right along. Thought it was, they were doing the right thing. And then verse 4 says, men actually obeyed the devil because it's the devil who gives authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and said, wow, how do you fight city hall? Who can make war against him? So, day 64, persecution begins. Babylon has been set up and its authority activated. Now, when Babylon rises, Jesus sends the second message in Prophecy 12, and it will be heard by everyone on earth. The second message will join up with the first message, and together this will make the second message highly inflammatory. The second message declares that Babylon's solution for resolving God's wrath is false. How do you tell the whole world they're going in the wrong direction? I'm having that trouble already. <laughs> and we're not even in the Great Tribulation. How do you tell the whole world that the idea of appeasing God's wrath so that it will stop is a false idea, and that its laws are an insult to the Creator, and its effort to stop moral decay and degeneracy, its efforts are evil. How do you tell the leaders of Babylon that? Because that is the truth. Of course, this sentiment will make the leaders of Babylon very angry with the 144,000, and they will be severely punished each time they are caught. So, Cassie, if you're one of the 144, you're going to have to move quickly. The first and second messages will be heard around the world for about two and a half years before the third message is heard. And these two messages will polarize the people of earth into three groups we talked about last night, the saints, the wicked, and the undecided. And then when the fifth trumpet occurs, the third message will come from Jesus. It comes as an ultimatum, and basically it goes like this. If anyone worships and obeys the glorious lamb-like beast who masquerades on earth as Almighty God, that person will be destroyed by Jesus at the second coming. The Bible reveals that Lucifer and his angels will be permitted to physically appear before the people of earth. He will do many things, one of which is to make believers out of unbelievers. Finally, a fourth message will be given by the 144,000 when the sixth trumpet sounds. This is when Lucifer sets up his counterfeit theocracy. And this fourth message is found in Prophecy 14. This angel comes down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. I'll talk about that later. Well, maybe I should say it right now. The idea here first of all, I want to make sure that you understand 
that what is being represented to John are these angels are coming from God's throne. Um, they're flying in midair and they come with a message from God's throne. Now, understand in John's day, they didn't have radio and satellites and that kind of thing. And so God is representing this to John in a cartoon way so that John could get the idea. And the idea is, is that each one of these angels comes over here. This is, this is God's throne. Okay? And this angel comes with a message from the throne, and he flies around the world to speak to every nation. So he's in midair. And so he's talking to the people down below, saying these messages that come directly from God. Now, you know that there's no angel that's actually going to do this. You understand what I'm saying? That's not a, that's, people aren't going to look up and see one angel in the sky zooming by. That, that's not what this is. What this is a caricature of, what this is representative of, is that this, the 144,000 will be all over the world, and guess what is coming out of their mouths? It's called the testimony of Jesus. Jesus speaks from the throne. The Holy Spirit brings it and puts it in their lips, and they speak, and out comes the message, and it's all over the world in one minute. That's what it really means. But it's represented as an angel flying or three angels flying with messages because God sends three messages to the whole world. But what the idea is, this is being broadcast from the sky. And the idea, how do you, how do you put it in simple terms, that the Holy Spirit takes the voice of Jesus, puts it in the mouths of each of his servants, and so... All at the same time, 144,000 mouths are saying the same thing. How do you say that in a few words? You do this with an angel just flying around the world, delivering this message. And it makes everybody mad. That's the cool part. <laughs> well, when the fourth angel comes... The Bible says he had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. What does that mean? Do you remember how Moses looked when he came down from Mount Sinai? What, what was the problem? He was so bright that the people couldn't, couldn't even stand around him. He had to wear a veil over his face. Right? That's what this means. The 144,000 in the fourth and final message, they're going to shine like Moses did when he came down off the mount. And the world is going to be illuminated by these people. And this will make them easy targets. Get the picture? They're all going to be killed. And it'll be easy to figure out who's who. The guy that's so bright that you can't look at him, that's the one you shoot at. <laughs> you get the point? And the earth was illuminated by his splendor. And with a mighty voice he shouted, fallen, corrupt, evil. Fallen is Babylon the great. She has become the home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit. A haunt 
for every unclean and detestable bird, the vultures. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. The message to come out of Babylon will be the last from God. Circumstances during the sixth trumpet will push the undecided into a firm decision. Those who refuse to worship Jesus and obey him will commit the unpardonable sin. Those who surrender to the demands of Jesus will have no choice but to live by faith. They will be sealed and included in his coming kingdom. Once every decision has been made, Jesus will conduct a special service in heaven. He will terminate God's generous offer of redemption with this declaration. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Meaning, there's no possibility of change. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. This service has puzzled a lot of Christians. But we know that it happens on the 1260th day. This is interesting. Watch this. I looked, Revelation 14, 14. Remember now, I am in the fourth element of Prophecy 12. There are five chronological elements in Prophecy 12, and I'm dealing with number four. Message one, two, three, and now this scene. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, Jesus with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, this is fascinating to me. Another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to Jesus, who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he, was, he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Then verse 17, another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he had too a sharp sickle, and still another angel who had charge of the fire at the altar of incense came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Now, take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of about 200 miles, about the length of ancient Israel. Now, let's go through some of the details so it makes sense to you. This scene reveals three interesting details. Number one, Jesus is told when to reap the saints. Remember? The angels came out of the temple and said to Jesus, harvest the earth. Why does Jesus need to be told when to harvest the earth? Any, any idea about that? Why, why would a sovereign Jesus, sitting on the throne, having all authority, why does he need to be told when to harvest the earth? Right here's the answer. Conflict of interest. Jesus is trying to save every soul. He is doing everything he can to save every soul. But yet, on the other side of the coin, he's carrying out the will of the Father. And the Holy Spirit has just reported to the Father that all decisions have been made Everyone is now sealed or marked, and the end has come. 
And Jesus is told, but from the Father, through the angel, okay, close the door. Make sense? And this all happens on the 1260th day. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, if Jesus and we know it's the 1260th day, why does he need to be told? Well, he needs to be told because he's carrying out the Father's will. And he does nothing that is outside the Father's will. That's why the Father tells him. The second thing we need to notice is that the wicked are reaped. Grapes are ripe and thrown into the great winepress of God's wrath. And the, the amount of, of, of grape juice that comes out of this, the amount of blood, you know, the juice of a grape is often called blood, the blood of the grape. The amount of blood is so great that it filled up a territory as large in John's vision as the nation of Israel up to a horse's bridle. The nation of Israel is about 50 miles wide and about 200 miles tall. And the amount of, uh, of blood from the wine press filled it up this high. That's the idea. It was enormous. All of these things point to this fact. It is better to walk alone than to be part of a crowd going in the wrong direction. Right? And the saints will be few in comparison to the number of the wicked. And then Prophecy 12 closes with a victory celebration. This celebration will take place in heaven on the 1264th day. On this day, the 144,000 will be resurrected, taken to heaven. They will gather around the throne of God, and they will sing a song of deliverance and vindication just before the seven last plagues began. This is, these seven last plagues represent the winepress of God's fury. This is, what, this is what God is going to use to crush the wicked. It's, this is the wine press, the seven bowls, the seven vials. The scene described in this prophecy, that is the celebration scene, is a repetition and enlargement of the scene presented in prophecy 11, back over in 14, chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Finally, consider the daunting challenge of being a prophet of God for a moment. When it comes to enduring the physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering that comes from condemning sin, speaking for God is one of the most difficult tasks on earth. Bible history reveals that God's prophets typically have a short lifespan because the carnal nature is hostile to the will and ways of God. Therefore, when God's prophets are required to speak inflammatory words, guess who gets hurt? To make the suffering even more difficult, the prophet simply said what God wanted said, not what she wanted or he wanted to say. That's a hard place to be put. Now, if you're angry and you want to say something and take a punch for it, that's one thing. But when you are sent in somewhere to say something that, that God wants said and you take a punch for it, <laughs> that's another thing. It's one thing to suffer for your own words, but suffering because someone else wanted certain things said is very difficult. Through the ages, God's prophets have been scorned, rejected, exiled, put in dungeons, tortured, and put to death because the carnal nature is hostile toward God, not subject to God's authority. Paul says so in Romans 8, 7. The sinful mind is hostile to God. Jesus warned his disciples they would be persecuted just as he had been. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. Religious leaders will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you think they will be offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Sixty years after, John, after Jesus spoke these words, the Apostle John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos because 
he spoke the words which Jesus gave him to speak. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the Bible and... When Jesus spoke through my lips, John said some very ugly things. <laughs> at least, at least that's what Vespasian thought. And that's what the Roman authorities thought. John said some inflammatory things, and they, he had to go to Patmos to die for it. He was on the Isle of Patmos because of the Word of God and for the words that Jesus spoke through his lips. The Word of God means Scripture. Scripture. The testimony of Jesus means words that Jesus spoke through his lips. Like the prophet John, the 144,000 will faithfully deliver the word of God and the testimony of Jesus during the great tribulation day after day without regard for the consequences and they will suffer in the extreme for doing so. And tomorrow night, I'm going to speak about this verse, which puzzles a lot of people. The 144,000 did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. This verse has been puzzling for many years. And I'm going to give you an explanation tomorrow night that, um, for me, settles the question. Now, it may not for you, but I'm going to do my best to confuse you. Let's stand for the benediction. Dear Lord, thank you for this study on the three angels' messages, the close of mercy, and the victory celebration of the 144,000. It's, it's wonderful, Lord, to understand and have a glimpse of how all these things fit together and their purposes and what your goals are. We see in Prophecy 12 that you intend to save the maximum number of people. That this plan, which you are carrying out, which the Father designed, is designed so carefully and thoughtfully that it will enable you, speaking through the lips of your servants, the prophets, to save every honest-hearted person. Wow. And without, without regard for religion or church connection or language or culture, you are able to determine who is honest in heart. We know that your judgment is righteous and true. We know that you uh, are anxious in every way to save to the utmost. And we anticipate and understand that at the end of this drama, there will be a numberless multitude that gathers around your throne who came out of the great tribulation. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful good news. And we treasure this in our hearts and will for the rest of our lives until we see you. This is our prayer in your wonderful name. Amen.